morning or afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I am Bud Harrell. I am an associate professor of religious education at Fordham. And uh, this is panel number three of the Spirituality and Disability Symposium. And it is on access and inclusion within Christian communities. I just want to remind you that the session is being recorded so that those who were not able to be present today will have the opportunity to view it at a future time. To begin, I want to um, acknowledge again that there are all kinds of disabilities, both visible and not visible, and that each person in our session will have their own re response and reactions to what is being discussed. We remind everyone to keep remarks, comments, and questions respectful and mindful. It is possible that you or someone else might find some of the things that we talk about to be distressing. And we encourage you to notice your own reactions and to practice self-care. So please feel free to take a break and step out um, if you need to. You're welcome to place comments and questions in the chat at any time for participants to consider and respond to. However, uh, please do not post personal critical remarks in the chat. If you wish to participate in the question and answer discussion with our panelists, please raise your virtual hand. And if you are joining via telephone, you can raise and lower your virtual hand by dialing star nine. When called upon, you may either send your questions uh, via the chat box or unmute yourself to ask your question, whichever makes the discussion more welcoming and accessible for you. We have three very gifted presenters for this panel. They are Tom Murphy, Thomas Gittner, and Allison Connolly Venner. And the format will be uh, each presenter will have 20 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for questions and discussion. And we begin with Tom Murphy. Uh, Tom Murphy is a PhD candidate in theology and education at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. His work seeks to foster an interdisciplinary dialogue between Christian theology, religious education and disability studies that emphasizes access and inclusivity for people with intellectual disabilities within these fields of inquiry. Tom is also a longtime member of the community of L'Arche and currently serves on the national staff of L'Arche USA. Tom, welcome. We'll turn the uh, mic over to you at this point. Thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? Yeah, good, good, thanks. Well, good morning, or uh, for me here in Massachusetts, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Uh, thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your Saturday to think through some of these important questions that we've been attending to in this uh, excellent symposium so far. Um, thanks to Father Frank, um, all the other organizers of the symposium at Fordham, and thank you, Bud, for convening us in this session. I'd like to further our conversation here today um, by proposing some ideas on how we might approach the work of theological and religious education in more accessible and inclusive ways for people with intellectual disabilities. So broadly speaking, I'm interested in how people with intellectual disabilities access the spiritual wisdom of our faith traditions and faith communities, and how those traditions and communities can be shaped and transformed by the spiritual wisdom of people with intellectual disabilities. I'm using the term inclusion throughout, but it's, it's truly this thicker sense of belonging that we've been talking about in the symposium that I'm after here. As John Swinton and many of the other presenters yesterday reminded us, from a Christian perspective, we must take account of the fact that the body of Christ is diverse. The Imago Dei is diverse. The Holy Spirit is diverse. And as Tom Reynolds uh, spoke about just a few minutes ago, how can our faith communities be places that, uh, I like the term he used, to disrupt this insider-outsider sense of so-called normalcy? So with these things in mind, how then can we best educate from and for a sense of robust belonging? Today, I'm proposing that one way to do that is to attend to the principles and practices of universal design for learning, UDL, 
um, and more on this a little bit later. I know there are many points of entry into this conversation, many ways to think about all of these terms, spirituality, theology, religious education, intellectual disability, a lot of definitional um, work could be done here. And I don't wanna to dwell too long um, in our limited time on definitions. So I'm just gonna invite you today to approach my contribution from your own perspective within and among these spaces. I invite you also, uh, especially today in the session to reflect on how you educate from and for a spiritual or faith perspective. And here too, there are so many ways to do this. Family life, our domestic church, catechesis, sacramental preparation, faith formation within our faith communities, a whole wide variety of ministerial settings, or maybe you engage in uh, teaching academic theology. It's likely wherever you are in this that education is some part of your work. And wherever you are in this, I hope that you can take away something for your work and think a little differently about how you teach in that environment. We rightfully think a lot about the ends of this work, um, but today I hope we can think a little bit about some of the means by which we do this work. I joined this conversation as a religious educator and theologian rooted in the Roman Catholic tradition with a long and valued association with the communities of L'Arche. I recognize too that I've benefited in unjust ways by largely conforming to ableist cultural norms of intellectual and physical ability, the normate identity construct that Rosemary Garland Thompson has noted. Especially so as those norms manifest in the hyper-intellectual world of higher education and the theological academy. I propose to fellow scholars and to ministers here, especially those who share with me the same unjust privileges that systemic ableism affords, that we endeavor in a meaningful and robust welcome of learner variability in our educational work. For me, this means grappling with my own ableist tendencies and ensuring that people with disabilities <clears throat> and accessibility are not simply afterthoughts or specializations within the teaching and learning of theology or religion that I do. So for me, it has to be about doing this work with uh, and not for people with intellectual disabilities. And again, as uh, Dr. Reynolds spoke so eloquently about this morning, I really appreciate his emphasis on the transformational hospitality that draws us to recognize that others come alongside us um, and that we belong together in this work. So again, there's many ways to enter this conversation and I wanna make a start by constructing a bit of a theoretical foundation from within the ongoing conversation among theologians of disability who nuance and expand both anthropological and spiritual considerations of human intellectual ability diversity. These are some of the theological pillars that support my turn to UDL. Some of the theological imperatives for more accessible and inclusive theological and religious education. So here I'll note just very briefly a small sampling of some of those pillars and imperatives that I've found in the work of Amos Young on a theological anthropology that foregrounds interdependence an emphasis on mutual responsiveness that I found in the work of Molly Haslam, and the way that Jill Harshaw centers the spiritual experience of people with profound intellectual disabilities in the theological concept of accommodation. And again, this is a really brief survey, and there's a whole lot more out there. So just wh wherever you can find your theological grounding, I think, is important in this work. Um, in his theological account of Down syndrome, Amos Young traces quote, an anthropology of interrelationality, end quote, that focuses on, quote, the interpersonal encounters and intersubjectivity, quote, end quote, that he finds, especially as he reflects on the life of his brother with Down syndrome. He says he finds this most palpably experienced in and between relationships involving people with disabilities. Young is noting here how the experience of disability can really foreground and amplify the intersubjective and interpersonal nature of our human experience. We are called to a deeper awareness and engagement with our human communality when we start with this interrelational premise. Jung grounds his anthropology of interrelationship in a diverse understanding of the Holy Spirit, quote, who has been poured out on all flesh, whereby people with and without disabilities can be caught up in the spirits blowing across the world, and in the process, their lives converge, even as what emerges are new lives enriched by one another, end quote. 
part of this enrichment is precisely our increasing recognition of the universality and necessity in all of our lives for mutuality, reciprocity, interdependence, and interrelationality. And further, he frames his theological anthropology in terms of friendships that cross falsely erected binaries and barriers, prying open pathways, as Dr. Reynolds said this morning. He writes, quote, when friendship flourishes, God's friendship with us and God's gift of friendship to us and for us, the us, them, or non-disabled, disabled dichotomies are overcome, end quote. Jung utilizes this understanding of human interrelationality and interconnection as a springboard for a more inclusive ecclesiology and a more general imagining of our human communities as places of friendship across perceived barriers. I find here a powerful theological impetus to attend to, to a, a theological impetus to attend to and to remove barriers to access in our theological and religious education, a point central to the contentions of UDL. The work of theologian Molly Haslam resonates with Young's interrelational anthropology as she offers a critique of the use of language and symbolism and their links to intentional human agency and capacity as foundations for our theological anthropology. Haslam writes, quote, I suggest an alternative understanding of Imago Dei or the image of God one that avoids the emphasis on a capacity or quality, intellectual or otherwise, and emphasizes instead mutual responsiveness, participation in the meeting between responsive partners, end quote. For Haslam, this includes not only responsiveness that employs symbolic material, but also non-symbolic modes of responsiveness. She demonstra demonstrates this through a phenomenological account of a relationship between two friends in which one who does not speak or communicate via what we might typically understand as symbolic modes of expression, nonetheless demonstrates more, quote, awake behavior, as she names it, at the sound of his friend's voice, such as increased martyr activity in his arms and legs, opened eyes and smiles. And so again, Here's a broadening and diversifying of the typical anthropological attributes of the Imago Dei beyond such things as intellect or agency or capacity. Haslam goes a bit further and posits that, this is our, that it is our communion with God and one another through mutual responsiveness that defines our humanity. Here she notes a similarity between what she's trying to do with mutual responsiveness and Martin Buber's theory of humanity as discourse between I and thou, much as, quote, to be human for Buber is to be in relation, to be human for Haslam is to be mutually responsive. Thus, those for whom intellectual understanding or symbolic communication are not the foremost attributes of their experience, their responsiveness, however construed, is wherein their humanity can be found. So like with Jung, here we have another highly relational anthropology that provides an important opening towards the welcome of human diversity and more robust sense of inclusion for people with intellectual disabilities. And another place I find inspiration and a good theological foundation for accessible and inclusive religious education is in Jill Harshaw's account of the theological concept of accommodation. The Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church defines accommodation in part as the adaptation of a text or teaching to altered circumstances, and this might mean giving a text in scripture a meaning not intended by the writer, or it might be a way to expound the mode of divine communication throughout the Bible, in which the divine revelation was accommodated to the human understanding. Now, there's a far more a uh, nuanced and complex argument around all of this and we can attend to today. However, Harshaw in her 2016 book, God Beyond Words, draws out many of the threads of this complexity to demonstrate its relevance for perspectives on the spiritual experience of people with profound intellectual disabilities. She's particularly concerned with people who do not communicate in a verbal manner. Harshaw quotes reformed biblical scholar D.A. Carson on the notion of accommodation, writing, quote, if the transcendent personal God is to communicate with us, 
his finite and sinful creatures, he must in some measure accommodate himself to and condescend to our capacity to receive that revelation, end quote. And for Harsha, and here quoting her again, people with profound intellectual disabilities are inevitably included within this us. She is concerned with expanding concepts of the spiritual life and relationship with God beyond the constraints of over-reliance on verbal expression and purely cognitive apprehension of revelation. Harshaw's work helps us to think about the possibility that God is always accommodating God's self to any human being. Each and every one of us requires some accommodation to apprehend God's self-revelation. As Harshaw concludes, quote, God acts to facilitate encounters. And ultimately, it is not human incapacity in any form that matters, but God's infinite capacity to accommodate his revelation to us. So again, I find this one of the helpful foundational pieces to begin constructing a theory and practice of accessible education and faith that can help us cultivate communities of belonging. If we all need accommodation of some sort, then perhaps instead of requiring that people reveal and name their accommodation needs, we expect and prepare our teaching and learning environments in such a way as to prepare for as wide a range of abilities and disabilities as possible. It's not perfect, but it's a good starting place. I'm gonna switch hats a little here from uh, theology and uh, think more about sort of nuts and bolts, religious education, pedagogical kind of uh, concerns. So how do the more expansive and relational anthropological construals or the account of accommodation just noted inspire and inform an approach to teaching theology or religion in a more innovatively inclusive manner, in a way that can cultivate belonging. For me, this inspires a proposal to utilize the principles and practices of universal design for learning, again, UDL, to help center intellectual variability, access, and inclusion as crucial pedagogical considerations. The emphasis within UDL on flexibility in how information is presented, how students demonstrate learning and knowledge, and how students engage in the teaching and learning environment can open new space wherein the theological anthropological considerations and the centering of accommodation named above can be more practically operationalized. The universal in UDL can be thought of in a similar manner as the universal in such as universal healthcare or something, not a universalizing uh, tendency, but. Uh, UDL arises from an application of uh, the universal design concept of architecture to principles of learning. As architects universally design the built environment for maximum access by the most amount of people, UDL proposes that variance across individuals is the norm, not the exception. And therefore, the curriculum should be adaptable to individual differences rather than the other way around. At the heart of UDL is the conviction that there is no one size fits all approach to teaching and learning. Or to put it another way, uh, quoting uh, authors Hall, Meyer and Rose here, traditional curricula have the disability because they only work for certain learners. This belief that curricula and pedagogy need to be adjusted for learners and not the other way around provides an important lodestar for accessible and inclusive theological education. The capacity of UDL to open up the learning environment lies in both its theoretical convictions that diversity is the real human norm and variability in learning is inevitable, as well as within its three grounding practical principles. And I'm gonna put a, a link here in the uh, chat if folks would prefer a little bit more of a, a visual uh, rendering of this, what I'm about to speak to. But uh, according to the principles of UDL, uh, Curricula, pedagogy, and learning environments must provide, one, multiple means of engagement to stimulate interest and motivation for learning, to provide flexibility in why students are learning something. Two, these environments must provide multiple means of representation to present information and content in different ways, providing flexibility in what students are learning. And three, these environments must provide multiple means of action and expression 
to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know, thus providing flexibility around how students learn. In each case, the UDL principles aim toward flexibility and creating access for the broadest spectrum of learners possible. I think UDL becomes clearer when we think about concrete application. So here are just two very brief examples. Any teacher who provides written notes along with their spoken lectures practicing the UDL principle of providing multiple means of representation, providing options for students to perceive what is being taught and learned. A deaf or hard of hearing student will still have access to the lecture via the notes provided. And the inverse is also true. A student who cannot read the notes for any reason will have access to the lecture as they listen to it. In another example, Whenever a teacher clearly and explicitly links the learning outcomes and goals of a course or an individual class or a ministerial engagement with the learning activities and assignments of the course or class or ministerial engagement again, then the teacher is promoting student interest and motivation, promoting student capacity for self-regulation and optimizing their choices for how they'll learn. And this is firmly within the UDL principle of providing multiple means of engagement for students. This enhanced access that's at the heart of UDL uh, has the potential to transfer the burden of adjustment from students to the materials and methods they encounter in the classroom. So in thinking about these examples of UDL, um, the application of UDL, I wonder what comes to mind for you in your own setting. In their 2018 book entitled Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone, Thomas Tobin and Kristen Bailing advocate a plus one approach to UDL. It's impossible to flip a switch and suddenly make your classroom or ministerial setting fully inclusive. And it can seem a daunting enough task that we might be tempted to not make the start that we need to make. Tobin and Bailing, however, advocate that we adopt plus one thinking about access and inclusion as we plan classes or events. They lay it out along the lines of the UDL principles. Is there just one more way that we can present information? Just one more way that we can help people to engage the material or the processes of a class or meeting, or just one more way that we can help people to express what they know about a topic of discussion. It's not that we stop once we've added one more option, but rather that it's, it's iterative. And every time we plan or add one more option to what we've already done, we, we get a bit more inclusive. Um, Thank you, Tom. Um, it, what a rich presentation. I think in the beginning, you um, explored well how we can uh, look at issues of um, disability and inclusion uh, from a uh, theological perspective. And in the second part of your presentation, uh, you gave us some very good examples of how we might do that on a practical level. It seems to me the heart of what you're suggesting on the practical level is it's, it's not so much... Um, like it, it's, it's about how we say, or how we do what we do in the classroom, as well as whatever um, the established curriculum is. Would you wanna say more about that? And I think even, maybe even a theological example, like you talked about the Imagio Dei, how do we teach in a way that presents the Imagio Dei inclusively, that uh, can enable the people to look at it, experience it in multiple ways? Yeah, Bud, thank you. Um, certainly, you know, like I said, I'm, it's, it's the means that I, I'm, I'm after. I mean, of course, the ends and, and the content is, is, is vitally important in, in our classes or um, in our uh, ministerial settings. But, but the way we do it, I think, um, really shapes the community that we're part of. So if we are, uh, you know, thinking theologically about the Imago Dei as inclusivity, um, as, as diversity, um, then we're going to need to make our our, our class about the Imago Dei uh, reflect that diversity or reflect that inclusivity. So um, I think to draw like a, a, the UDL um, uh, principles into teaching a theological concept such as that would, would allow us to uh, more fully uh, express that, that diversity of the Imago Dei. So. If you have questions or comments for Tom, please put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and uh, we can call on you. Um, while we see, while we wait to see, oh, here's um, Ann Masters. Do you want to unmute yourself and comment, Ann? 
Sure. Yes. Thank you, Tom. I, I agree with everything you said, obviously. Right. <laughs> and um, but one of the and, and in fact, Wolf Wolfensberger, who I referenced, um, the father of social role valorization, um, he back as far as the 1970s, he chastised um, some of the the catechetical organizations within the Catholic Church for their emphasis on efficiency, quote unquote, um, and as if the content and and the program, the material itself was the object rather than the experience of being um, the body of Christ in the journey. So and and in my own work, I, so what I but I wonder, and again, I agree with everything you said in terms of what we're looking to do. Um, are you thinking about the ways that we help the catechist with his or her group of learners on this journey? Because within the Catholic Church, as you realize, oftentimes they're people of good intentions and heart, um, may have developed theology or not, um, and often are not educators either. So, so the the classic model, unfortunately, is let's have everyone take turns reading out of the book. So, have, do you have, you have comments? So, it's almost like the universal design for learning has to first take into account, I think, the catechists and the pastoral and the parish catechetical leaders to engage them in the journey. Yeah, and it's a great point, and you know, I. I've thought through like, how, how does this, you know, I think my own setting at like Boston College, like how, we're training leaders for the church. We're training ministerial leaders there. And um, I, you know, I, if I had my way, everybody would get a class in universal design for learning or, or you know, critical disability theory or something like that to take out with them into to their ministry. That's not the case, of course. But, um, you know, yeah, I think your point is is well taken. It needs to be um, at that level of the people who are leading those those you know catechetical or ministerial formation places in their their parishes that that get this kind of information. And so, so seminaries, uh, you know, um, theologians, place, places like that that are training those people need to have some of this. I think you know, it's, yeah, it's a great point though, Anne. Thank you. It's not it's not the seminaries um, that are training the catechists. That's another topic in itself, actually. Sure, sure, right. yeah, yeah. But but just to, if if we could get that into into the mix there for for yeah. people to be aware of, you know, if, if pastors had a sense of it too, it'd be helpful. But yeah, if I could just add on, so like I I have used um, picture communication exchange, like translated gospel stories with what's called board with board maker picture images or so forth, and and I know other folks that have done that too. But one of the things I'm thinking, like as within with within um your and i where are you in or do you live within a large community or what's your role in large i i have in, in past years i i work on the national team now though so because one of the things so one of the things that would be a great opportunity i think with large would be and i know there has been more of a intentionality of engaging with community and helping individuals with intellectual dis developmental disability engaging within community and also helping to shape communities to be more welcoming that could be an area of great assistance i think for intentionally forming collaborative relationships to for you know for formation of catecheticals um catechists and catechetical leaders yeah that's it's a great point um and something that we certainly talk about within large as, as a way that we could uh something we could offer in, in a broader con construct so yeah no, oh, great points, Anne. Thank you. There's, there's miles to go yet, of course, on this. Thank you, Anne. It's time to move on. Um, thank you, Tom, for your wonderful presentation. I know, Tom, that UDL, Universal Design for Learning, can be a wonderful resource for catechists and religious educators. If you had um, resources that you might direct us to, perhaps you could put them in the chat so that um, they could be things people could explore that might... Uh, they, they might be able to include in their uh, practice as religious educators and catechists. Yeah, absolutely. And that link that I put there uh, is to, to cast.org and it will, uh, it would, there's a whole wealth there, but I'll also be happy to put a few book titles in the chat. So thanks, bud. Okay, thank you. Our next presenter is Thomas Grinter. Uh, Thomas earned a master's degree 
of a master's of divinity degree summa cum laude at Hood Theological Seminary in Salisbury, North Carolina, and a master's of theology degree in Old Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. Currently, he is pursuing a PhD uh, in Bible culture and hermeneutics at Chicago Theological Seminary. He serves as a full-time instructor in biblical studies at Hood Theological Seminary. He is also an ordained itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church and has served in congregations across the country for over 20 years. Thomas's presentation is titled Testimony and Trauma Toward a Spiritual Practice of Disability Lament. Uh, Thomas, welcome. We're glad that you could be here with us today, and I'll gladly turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Bud, and good morning, everyone. I'm grateful to be a part of uh, this discussion at the symposium, uh, and uh, I'm excited to share my research about testimony and trauma. Um, first, I guess, before I discuss my, my paper, um, my paper has a lot to do with my own personal experience as a, as a person living with a pretty severe visual impairment uh, that was caused because I was born premature. So I've dealt with disability for my entire life. And so much of my paper starts with discussing and sort of theorizing my own experience uh, with disability within the context of the black church. And of course, I don't want to uh, uh, assume or speak of the black church as a monolith. I also don't want to assume that, you know, uh, the experiences of people with disabilities are all the same within the black church. So I just want to emphasize my paper comes from my own experience within um, my particular African American Christian tradition. Um, so Growing up uh, with the with the disability, some of my earliest memories are of ministers and lay people uh, uh, in the church uh, placing an uh, emphasis on healing. Um, countless times, I was prayed for, anointed in in public services. Ministers would even visit my home to pray for me, to anoint me as a child. Um, and, and to, you know, to pray for my healing. And while in my childhood, I didn't quite understand what was happening. Um, it was very awkward to me as why so many people were so concerned about me uh, and my condition. But I noticed that throughout my childhood and early teenage years, that was the focus in, in, the churches I visited, um, and as I've gotten older and, and, and looked more closely into these issues, I realized that a lot of that rhetoric was based in a neo-Pentecostal discourse that, that focus on faith healing. Um, and although as I got older, those experiences sort of de decreased, I found myself embracing that discourse about understanding myself as needing to be healed, uh, believing that there was something wrong with me. Um, so in my paper, I discuss testimony and then my paper sort of centers on the practice of testimony um, within the black church tradition. But of course, testimony is a biblical, you know, scriptural tradition uh, that goes far beyond, of course, the black church within the, 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 the global uh, church, and it's been practiced for centuries, of course, but within the Black church tradition, testimony on one hand is a, uh, a theological practice, right, whereby a, an individual uh, names a, an experience of God, and it's ex an experience that focuses on struggle and some sort of difficulty, especially uh, within the history, African American history, it's a, it's a testimony that focuses on the struggle for racial justice, the struggle against discrimination, uh, typically. And um, within that testimony, the individual names God as a God of uh, liberation, which is a key focus within Black theology. So 
Uh, a testimony typically shares a, a moment of difficulty, but then it praises God for God's goodness, God's love, God, God's mercy, God's deliverance. Um, and within the practice of testimony, that individual uh, is sort of integrated into the broader Christian community, you know, because their individual story becomes a part of that larger communal story that the God is a God of liberation, you know, is a God of deliverance, is a, is a good and loving God who cares. Um, and the way that testimony showed up in my experience as a disabled person is um, as I got older, people within the church began to testify about me. The rhetoric on healing uh, sort of stopped or at least decreased. But what I saw what, was that people started to testify about me that they were so impressed at how independent I was. They were so impressed at how inspirational I was. Everything I did, no matter how minor, became an occasion for people to, to say how good God was for enabling me to overcome my disability. And, and within my paper, I discussed that uh, under the rubric of, you know, um, the super crip ideology uh, and even rhetoric of hyper ability so that, so that uh, people would say, uh, well, you know, he can't see very well, but his hearing is great. Or he has this enhanced power to perceive mentally uh, or discern. And um, I look into critical disability studies and, and uh, studies on blackness and disability uh, in my paper to, to, to talk about uh, that tendency toward, uh, again, the super crip uh, ideology and uh, hyperability rhetoric, particularly about black people because within the history of black people in this country, blackness, in a physical sense, has always been interpreted as hyperability. Uh, you know, when you look at um, ableist and racist uh, ideologies around blackness, you know, um, black people could always run faster, jump higher, work harder, or stronger. Um, and, and, and the ways that that rhetoric is adopted by, um, uh, within ableism. Uh, and how that showed up in my own experience. Um, and another part of the testimonies about me or a, a way of generally describing them were, were narratives of overcoming. They praise God for allowing me to overcome my disability. And I saw myself embracing those narratives. I began to uh, agree with the stories they were telling about my body uh, because it gave me a way of feeling accepted within this community, feeling less different from them. Um, and it gave me a way to understand my own experience theologically. So I started to testify about myself that yes, God had in fact allowed me to overcome uh, my disability. That became the story I told in job interviews, meeting new people in school, all that sort of thing. and. Um, so in my paper, I connect this all with the work of Michel Foucault. Uh, Foucault focused on confession, the, the role of confession that grew out of the Christian church, but then impacted Western society in general, where um, it sort of becomes a, a technology of power, a strategy used to require people to confess things about themselves, uh, in a quest for truth and the way that uh, Mr. Foucault describes confession as a way of uh, defining who people are, you know, the way that discourse constitutes subjectivity. That's what they were doing to me. That's what I began to do with, to myself is name myself as a disabled person within this neo-Pentecostal discourse on testimony. Um, and so um, ultimately, my paper, I, I, I suggest that 
again, the that way of using testimony in the Black church tradition uh, within those ableist ideologies is a, is a technology of power of domination because while they demanded me to speak of my body in a, in a particular way, testimonies also dependent on silence. You know, and Foucault talks about the, the role of silence within in this course as another strategy of power. Uh, because while I could talk about myself as having overcome my disability or about how God accommodated for my low vision with by enhanced hearing or something like this, I could not testify about my disability as trauma and, and the experience of suffering that I endured due to my impairment and due to its enabling effect in society. And so uh, my goal in my paper is to suggest that lament could be an alternative way whereby people with disabilities can uh, use a strategy, uh, what, what Foucault calls a technology of the self, a practice that disabled people can, uh, can enact whereby they are allowed to name themselves, not adopt uh, ableist ideologies in the dominant discourse, but tell their own stories about their own bodies, about their own experiences. And so I rely on the, the biblical tradition of lament where, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the Psalms, several of the Psalms, some of the oldest Psalms are lament Psalms. And within those texts, it gives space for a range of emotions, not just praising God, but complaining, anger, rage against God and about what God has and has not done. Um, so I, I, I look at that as a framework that uh, the church can adopt to allow people with, with various impairments to express their own experiences. Um, and within that, those laments, uh, they don't always have to end on a word of hope or trust. It can just be an expression of the pain, the suffering, the trauma that's endured. Uh, as, a, as a prayer to God, as an expression to God, that's still just as theologically permissible, uh, that still allows them to be included within the Christian community without being um, constituted by ableist narratives. Uh, so I hope that, hope that makes some sense, but uh, happy to entertain any questions you may have. Um. Thomas, I, that's a wonderful presentation. I think you articulated well, to use Foucault's language, how um, healing testimony in silence um, has been, ha, or discourses of technology uh, that have been used in the church to exercise power and domination over people. But what I find um, so fascinating about your your presentation is you, you talk about a practice of lament, which is also a central practice to the church as a practice that can be a technology of self uh, that can allow the voices of uh, people who have been othered or marginalized uh, to express themselves, uh, to find a sense of self in relationship to God and others within a Christian faith community. So I, I find it fascinating the way you're, you're sort of uh, critiquing tradition, the Christian tradition, but at the same time drawing from it to show how we can move forward in ways that um, enable us to create more inclusive communities. So thank you. Uh, we, we do have a question here from Ann or comment from Ann. Ann, go ahead. Thank you, Tom, for sure. Is this the morning of the Toms, by the way? I just noticed this. <laughs> But um, thank you I, I, it, for sharing your experience and your perspectives. I, I think actually the, um, you know, the spirituality of lament is very rich. But, you know, the other thing, and I totally understand your con the concerns that you've expressed about the narratives that were some of the, some of the narratives, at least regarding your experience as witness. But the other thing. Um, I keep going back to is, you know, when we look at mindsets, 
that people have and and um, I'm a broken record on social role valorization. I'm sorry, guys, but it just I find it such a useful tool to not only it's the her the hermeneutics to understand what happens in in devaluing and marginalizing people, but then the constructive framework to move beyond that. And and with the other thing that you're ex that the the witnesses that were given about you provided an opportunity of example that this is someone who cannot see you know visually with his eyes but he can do other things in other words folks who are blind are not as limited as we had believed and it's it's because in those sh it's in the so so if you can you know resurrecting your own testimony of um and helping people to and giving people the language to talk about it even is that it's demonstrating that other that the ability and what else you can do that's huge because those counter examples, but in a positive way, is what helps to change people's expectations. It's it's the you know, <clears throat> and I think that would be really important. And the other thing with the lament and building on that, um, I found um, Jamil Zaki, research in motivated theory of empathy, which is essentially compassion, provides really good um, resources for us within our work that um, within communities that, that profess respect for human dignity, individuals who have been marginalized, who share their experiences and of how it feels to be, um, you know, so the lament, but then also of your dreams to, to foster that connection, that relatability and recognizing we, as opposed to us and them. Um, he did some really good, like, so for example, empathy curriculums have been really helpful in diminishing bullying in schools. And also there was interesting research with medical professionals for them to increase their compassion, true compassion about patients with intellectual disability. So just some thoughts I wonder if you um, might wanna think, respond to. Yeah, thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind, and if you would put his name in the chat, I would love to you know, sure. uh, learn more about his research. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely see your point. I do, uh, looking back on it, very much appreciate the attempt that was being made to uh, give me access into the church by, by I think, um, congregants sort of searching for how can we help Thomas? How can we, you know, keep him a part of us? And I think initially by, by focusing on healing, but when that strategy didn't work, then yeah, by, by trying to say, well, yeah, he has these other capacities that need to be celebrated. Um, so definitely, I, I, I definitely value and appreciate um, that attempt and that 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 interest they had in me. Um, uh, but at the same time, yeah, noticing that those attempts did not include listening to me, you know, or or encouraging me to share my own perspective. It was just an attempt to make me fit within, you know, this, this broader framework, uh, which, I, you know, I, I don't fault them for or think that it was at all intentional. But um, uh, but yeah, I, th I think you're definitely right. Uh, it is a good sign that they were trying to give me access to the, the that space. Uh, but on the inclusion end of it. I, I guess I guess I think I think of it as the difference between integration and inclusion. Well, yeah, and I guess so. So, and what I'm so I'm not suggesting to like accept it as it had been, but and but maybe see it as an opportunity for you to reclaim your narrative and resurrect it to provide the positive, more constructive example. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think that that has to come through dialogue, right? I mean, you know, uh, um, not just testifying about me but listening to me and you know uh in conversation and i think from that creating a, a new space of inclusion yeah yeah so okay thank you uh isabella uh, isabella had her hand up for uh, a, a while ago there did you have something to add isabella or a question or comment um I didn't raise my hands, but I have something uh, to comment. I'm from Indonesia, 
and uh, I think your experience also very relevant here in Indonesia. Uh, for us, people with disability uh, feel very uh, reluctant even to come to church because most of the time they only become the object of pity. So uh, when you um, uh, recommend a lament as part uh, of the liturgy and how it will be very helpful for people to express uh, their range of feelings to God, I think uh, it will be good idea also to uh, suggest to churches in Indonesia. And thank you so much for uh, this uh, very powerful insights. Thomas, did you want to respond or comment? Yeah, thank you. I'm definitely glad you found it helpful. And, and even I think even not just uh, disability commit, the lament can be useful in you know public worship but also as a personal practice just whether it's writing your story or recounting your story just giving yourself that space to to name your own experience to name your own emotions around that experience i think is is, is important um, yeah yeah okay, thank you we have a question or comment from lynn lynn Yes, thank you, Thomas. I, I find that your emphasis on the, the limits side of things is really, really important and not often en enough brought up. And I wanted to touch on, on your point about the super crip identity or what I've always called the heroic disabled and how, how damaging that can be for the person who has it because then they feel like they have to be a poster boy for for, for something or for people who don't, who get the question, well, look at him, look what he can do. Why can't you do this too when the circumstances could be very, very different? So I just wondered if you'd run into any of that or could discuss that a little. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, uh, not outside of the church uh, realm, you know, even, even uh, in jobs I've had in schools, I was often used as the example that Thomas, look at him, he's doing so well, why can't you? And it just alienates me from, from other students or coworkers, um, that rhetoric. Um, um, and again, super crip, you know, it's about any little thing that I accomplish, no matter how minuscule, is gets all this attention. So it's it can be very embarrassing, uh, very isolating, very, again, alienating. Um, and just a lot of pressure to, to constantly perform uh, well so that, um, you know, to, to again, kind of fit within that, that narrative um, can be, yeah, definitely a lot of pressure. So, uh, and, and I also should say that I'm still wrestling with a lot of these things in my own personal life. Uh, again, trying to figure out how do I tell my own story? Um, when all, all, you know, these narratives constitute so much of the language around disability that we have to sort of find new language and new words to describe it. And that, that definitely is a struggle sometimes, yeah, so. so thank you, thank you. We have a, another question from Lori. Hi, Thomas. I was wondering if you have found a commentary or a writer um, helpful in changing some of the problematic parts of the scripture for preachers and teachers um, where they talk about blindness and sight as opposites and, and often have a, ne a negative stereotype that blindness is the negative of the two. Have you found anyone that, that's helpful that, that makes the stories more inclusive for you? Um, Hector Avalos. Um, A-V-A-L-O-S. He's developed a method of reading the Bible called sensory criticism, where he sort of pays attention to how things like blindness, sight, deafness, sound, you know, all that plays a role in interpretation, biblical interpretation. Um, there's a commentary, um, I want to say it's called Disability in the, in the Bible. It's a, it's a one volume commentary. Uh, one of the editors is, is Sarah Melcher, um, M-E-L-C-H-E-R. Um, 
I can't think of the other the other editor, but uh, as they survey the various books of the Bible, they highlight those issues, especially uh, blindness as a metaphor for ignorance, you know how, uh, or or um, deafness as a metaphor uh, for stubbornness, but sight as a metaphor for, you know salvation even, or, or uh, hearing as a metaphor for obedience, just the way disability you, is used in, in those negative ways in, uh, in biblical metaphors. So um, those are a couple couple people I would recommend checking into. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Jason has uh, listed the, the names and the uh, one of the books in the chat. So if you're interested in the sources, they're there in the chat for us. And then we have uh, a question from Lindsay. Hi, um, I really appreciated your talk. I, you put into words things that have been swimming around in my head quite a lot. And uh, it was just really helpful. Um, <clears throat> articulating the words is hard. And um, as I think, about, I've been thinking about ableism a lot. That's our theme for the upcoming year in my organization. And um, thinking about the words we use and we're, you know, we don't, I, I loved what Isabella said about not wanting to be an object of pity, right? Um, so we don't want to say things like people suffer with a disability. I think in some ways uh, we might, you know, play up abilities and downplay disabilities. Um, but then other times with ableism, we're saying, well, let's celebrate a disability, like just this is different ways that God has created people. And I think those are all important things to be thinking about, but I, I've been struggling with the lament piece in that when we, when we kind of emphasize, like, we can't say this, we can't say that, uh, then what about people who do suffer, right? Like, I deal with depression and I find it very healing when someone talks about suffering from depression during a prayer at my church, for example, because I do suffer with it when I'm dealing with it, you know, um, not always, but, <clears throat> but I find that helpful because it's that lament piece. Um, and so how do we leave room for parents who have learned new information about their child that has your shift for them and, and leave room for them to say, wow, this is different than what I expected. Or a person who gets a diagnosis and their life takes a totally different turn, right? Mm -hmm. We can't just focus on ability and celebrating various ways that God has made people because that's not the way individuals always experience it. So I guess I just, I don't even have a great question here. It's just, you hit on like exactly what I've been struggling with, with the tension between uh, how we talk and this idea of um, like, I, I'm learning a lot about ableism and trying to really uh, live into that. And also wanting to say, we gotta leave room for people to have lament or to have grief or for life to not be like, to say, this is really hard. It's not fair or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want to assume that on people, but we also need to leave space that people can like name that and not feel like they can't. And so your story really was helpful. So anyway, just your thoughts on that. How do we navigate? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's very difficult. And, and I think because, uh, you know, I think we're both on the same page about at least understanding the impairment, you know, whatever impairment we may we may deal with as as including suffering or pain or rage or frustration. Um, and I think the best thing to do uh, is again, to recover uh, the biblical tradition of lament, really look at the lament Psalms. Because like I said, the typical flow is that they start off by expressing you know, pain or frustration or anger. And then the person at the end normally uh, will end on a word of hope or trust in God, that God would change things or things will improve. Uh, and I think definitely that typical style of lament can be helpful. But sometimes the lament psalms don't end on that word of hope or trust. Sometimes it's just all anger, it's all rage, it's all frustration. Um, and that's okay, the, the, that made it into the Bible, that counts as scripture. Um, and so if, if 
if that's true of the Bible, why can't it be true of our experiences today? So um, to, to convince people that lament is a theological, uh, you, you know, theologically allowable way to express, you know, our, our human experience to God, uh, we can use the, the, the Psalms, especially, the, but there are laments elsewhere in the Bible, but we can say to people, look, it's, it's here in scripture. So, yeah. Yes. Well, it's, it's time to move on. Thomas, I'd like to thank you for um, a stimulating presentation and all of you who contributed to this wonderful, um, exhilarating discussion. Uh, just a point to add is that uh, there are, um, we don't have time to look at them, but there are wonderful comments in the chat, particularly by Laura and Amy, that, uh, that you may be interested in going back and reviewing for some, um, to stimulate further thought. We'll move on to our third presenter, and our third presenter is Allison Connolly Vetter. And Allison is, or Allison received a Master's of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary. While in graduate school, she studied interdisciplinary approaches to disability theology and madness, and was a co chair of the Disability Justice Caucus. She has received the Harold H. Wilk Scholarship from the United Church of Christ for her work on disability theology. Her writing can be found in Dear, Dear Joan Sister, Conversations with Women in the Church, and another book, Liberating Liturgies 2.0. Allison currently serves as a racial justice organizer for the Center for Sustainable Justice, and as the Children, Youth, and Families Coordinator for Spirit of St. Stephen's Catholic Community, and the Center and the Catholic Community are both in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Allison, it's a delight to welcome you here, and Allison's presentation is on, is, it, is titled, What is Christian Ableism? Thanks, Bud. So good to be here with you all. Uh, for accessibility purposes, I'll start with an image description of myself. So I'm a white woman with short brown hair. I'm wearing glasses and a gray shirt and I'm sitting in my office. I'll also start by locating myself and my identities. I'm a white, disabled, queer, cisgender woman. And I come to this conversation from both a Catholic and a United Church of Christ perspective. And as Anne brought up, I do have to apologize that my name is not Thomas. I'm ruining a great streak that we had going this morning. I'm going to be talking today about Christian ableism, which is a framework that I'm proposing to understand those manifestations of ableism, which would be impossible if not for Christianity. And I have to be honest that I don't think another academic or theoretical framework is going to save the world. But I do think that understanding Christian ableism can give us an understanding of Christian responsibility for repairing the harm done by ableism that happens in specifically Christian contexts. Today, I'm going to be talk, talking about some topics that we've talked about already, especially that Thomas just talked about, cure, denial of sacraments, inspiration porn, and opposition to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And these are all, in my understanding, manifestations of explicitly Christian ableism. I'll talk through that a little later. As we get into this idea of Christian ableism, let's first center ourselves in what definition of ableism I'm using. And my definition of ableism comes from Talila Lewis. And Talila Lewis updates this definition of ableism each year. This is the definition of ableism Talila Lewis has updated for January, 2022. TL writes, ableism is a system of assigning values to people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, productivity, desirability, intelligence, excellence, and fitness. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in eugenics, anti-Blackness, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This systemic oppression leads to people and society determining people's values based on their culture, age, language, appearance, religion, birth or living place, health and wellness, and or their ability to satisfactorily produce, reproduce, quote, excel, and quote, behave. TL adds, you do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. 
And that's the definition of ableism that I'll be working with in this presentation. So in my understanding, Christian ableism as a framework can be rooted in Christian scriptures, history, or tradition. Christian ableism does not mean that all Christians are ableist, and it does not mean that other faith traditions or secular systems are not also ableist. We know that ableism is everywhere. But the framework of Christian ableism does mean that there are distinct manifestations of ableism, which would be impossible if not for Christianity. Again, that's Christian history, tradition, sacred texts, and theology. And Christian ableism can only be repaired in a Christian context. As an aside, the research that I've done for this presentation, which comes from my master's thesis, is grounded not only in academic sources, but also in the lived experience of disabled people. This includes experiences coming from social media, blog posts, comment threads, personal communication, and more. The lived experience of disabled people is so frequently shut out of academic research. And so it felt important to me to gather these experiences in non-academic ways. My first manifestation of Christian ableism that I'll focus on here are prayers to Jesus for a miracle cure. We've talked about cure. We just, Lindsay just brought up this great question of cure, um, how it's not straightforward. There's not an easy answer. Disability theorist Eli Clare writes of the need for, quote, neither a wholehearted acceptance nor an outright rejection of cure, but rather a broad-based grappling. While some disabled Christians may want a cure or may want treatment for a medical condition or embodied experience, many others do not want a cure. Regardless of desire for cure, many disabled people believe that they are created in God's image and the Imago Dei as good, whole, and holy. Eli Clare writes that cure sometimes requires a body or mind to be damaged or broken. Whereas many disabled folks locate a primary problem of disability not in their body or mind, but rather in the architecture and attitudes of an ableist society, as many of us refer to as the social model of disability. Many disabled people believe that the abled insistence on cure is so prevalent because disability is uncomfortable for the abled person to process as it brings up questions like we've talked about earlier today of mortality, fragility, and vulnerability. As disability justice activist Leah Lakshmi Pipienza Simran Sinha writes, an overemphasis on cure would disappear disabled people from society, disappearing to the particularities of the disabled experience. She writes, cure is elimination. Regardless of desire for cure, almost every disabled person I know, myself included, could share an experience of being prayed over non-consensually for a miracle cure. Often these non-consensual prayers happen from strangers in public and involve non-consensual touch, such as a laying on of hands, an anointing, grabbing by the elbow, slowing someone down physically. Disability activist Imani Barberin talks of how one day 12 separate people in one day without her prompting or consent prayed over her that she would be cured. This insistence on cure happens so frequently in a Christian context that some refer to it as the cure agenda. From my own experience, these prayers are disorienting and uncomfortable at best and harmful and violent at worst. One time a well-intentioned friend prayed that I would be cured of my disability without further medical treatment or care, but I did not want her prayer I was not cured after her prayer and I did not want to be. And it left me in an awkward divine triangle and I'm making a triangle with my hands. Was I not cured because her prayer was not strong enough? Was I not cured because God was not strong enough? Or was I not cured because even I was too far gone for God to cure me? Nobody wins in this non-consensual prayer triangle. Not the disabled person, not the person praying and certainly not God. While telling disabled people that they should be or should want to be cured is not limited to Christianity, the prayers to Jesus specifically for healing and claiming Jesus's cure miracles in the Christian Testament as a basis for insistence on cure, that is explicitly Christian and would be impossible if not for Christianity. Thus the Christian cure agenda is one manifestation of Christian ableism. 
Another way that Christian ableism manifests is through the denial of Christian sacraments to disabled individuals, whether children or adults. Unfortunately, in the Christian tradition, there are incredibly harmful examples of disabled people being excluded from sacraments. Take the example of Anthony Lacuna, an eight-year-old autistic child. He and his family, including parents Jimmy and Nicole, were parishioners of St. Aloysius Church in Jackson, New Jersey. As an eight-year-old Catholic, Anthony was preparing for the sacraments of reconciliation and first communion in 2019. He had been preparing for these sacraments through a religious education program for two years. At no point during those two years did anybody associated with the program indicate that Anthony's autism posed a potential problem for sacramental participation. But in February 2020, two months before Anthony was supposed to receive First Communion, Anthony's parents were told by the parish that he would not be able to participate in the sacrament because he is autistic. The priest who made this decision argued that because Anthony does not communicate verbally, his disability must mean he is not able to tell right from wrong. The priest emphasized that telling right from wrong is a benchmark that must be reached before receiving Eucharist. Anthony's parents were outraged. They wrote on Facebook, this is very hard and upsetting to comprehend when we are all created by God. And now our son is being shunned from his Catholic faith due to his inability to communicate. As my own aside, in the Catholic tradition, we consider the Eucharist the source and summit of our faith. Denying Anthony from receiving First Communion is not simply denying him a celebration and a participation in family history. It is, in a meaningful way, denying him access to the core of his religion. The Facebook page Disabled Feminist shared the news story about Anthony Lacuna and multiple commenters shared their own stories of disabled people being denied sacraments. Facebook user Allison Briggs writes in a comment, I know someone whose sister had cerebral palsy and was told she was going to hell for not having a soul and that she could not be baptized or have communion. Sacramental exclusion is yet another manifestation of Christian ableism because only Christians, usually Christian ministers, can deny someone access to a Christian sacrament. Another manifestation of Christian ableism that we've talked about already today is comparing disabled people to angels who are perfect and sinless. One of my friends has a sister with Down syndrome. At church one Sunday, the priest walked over to her sister, told her to stand up and introduced her to the church as an angel and a model of how to live a pure and sinless life. My friend's sister was deeply uncomfortable, embarrassed and surprised. She had no warning and no consent about her use as a prop in this man's homily. This is a Christian version of inspiration porn, a term coined by disability activist Stella Young. Stella Young defines inspiration porn as, in, in, defines inspiration porn as depictions of disability, which depict disabled people as inspirational simply for existing or accomplishing tasks that non-disabled people also accomplish. It marks the disabled subject as a source of inspiration for the non-disabled. This priest's actions tick all the boxes of inspiration porn. My friend's sister was not doing anything exceptional. She was simply being herself and sitting in church with her family. The priest marked her as a source of inspiration for the non-disabled, in this case, hoping she would inspire the non-disabled people present in the church to strive for sinless perfection. When confronted with the concept of inspiration porn, some inspiration porn, many folks, Christian and non-Christian alike, fail to understand why it is harmful. But Jan Grew offers three reasons in response. First, inspiration porn objectifies disabled people. Second, inspiration porn devalues a disabled existence. And third, and perhaps most importantly, inspiration porn locates the problem of disability squarely in the realm of the individual and their impairment suggesting that the problem of disability can be overcome through individual efforts, neglecting to address structural and systemic causes. While inspiration porn is everywhere in society, you'll see it in any commercial break if you're looking for it, this Christian inspiration porn uses disabled people as inspiration for Christian religious or spiritual goals, such as being sinless or reaching heaven. While Christian ableism is not responsible for all inspiration porn, it is responsible for that inspiration porn, which takes a Christian form, role, or language. One final example of Christian ableism is historical, but with massive contemporary consequences. 
Christian opposition to the Americans with Disabilities Act. While a handful of Christian churches supported the ADA, the majority actively lobbied to be exempted from its requirements. As one example, William Bentley Ball, arguing on behalf of the Association of Christian Schools International, opposed the ADA because it would be too expensive to make Christian institutions accessible and due to fears about government in intrusion on religious decision-making. These arguments made by Ball and others were often explicitly rooted in ableism and also homophobia. For instance, as part of his argument, Ball claimed that Christians were morally required to discriminate against carriers of AIDS where AIDS was incurred through immoral conduct. Other aspects of Ball's argument were more subtle in their ableism. He claimed that, quote, nothing has been shown to indicate that there is a national necessity to apply the ADA bill to churches, religious schools, and other ministries, end quote, implying that there either are no disabled people in Christian spaces or disturbingly that there should not be. Quickly, others such as Robert P. Dugan, director of the National Association of Evangelicals Office of Public Affairs, joined Ball's argument and pleaded for Christian institutions to be exempt from the ADA. Dugan and his organization represented some 37,000 local congregations in 45 denominations with a total service constituency of 15 million people. These arguments were successful as we all know and Christian institutions are fully exempt from the ADA and legally allowed to discriminate against disabled people. Often this discrimination against disabled individuals takes the form of architectural or physical accessibility. If churches without elevators or ramps fell under the purview of the ADA, they could be forced to undergo the renovations needed to make churches accessible. Other times the church is inaccessible because it does not include braille worship aids or ASL interpreters or other necessary accommodations. If the church were bound by the ADA, congregants could take legal action to ensure that the church could become more accessible. But instead, due to explicit lobbying by Christian congregations, disabled congregants are too often at the whim of the pastor or authority figure. And I'll close with this. Why does this matter? Why does it matter to understand that there are some manifestations of ableism which are explicitly Christian? And I'll tell you why. It's because it's easy to think of ableism as an out there problem. It's easy to think of ableism as one of many things that is wrong in the world. But when we understand that Christian ableism has everything to do with our Christian spirituality for those of us who identify as Christian, that it is inside our walls, inside our institutions, inside our churches, it becomes clearly and obviously our responsibility to undo. And in fact, I would argue that only we can undo it. With an understanding of Christian ableism comes the responsibility for Christian anti-ableism, Christian transformation and repair and elimination of ableist harm within our own institutions and churches and communities. So let us work together to undo Christian ableism wherever we find it. I'd love to hear your questions and response. Thank you, Alice, and that was very stimulating. Um, so you've talked about Christian ableism as it's presented in the cure agenda, sacramental exclu exclusion, uh, inspiration porn, and Christian opposition to the ADA. And in your presentation, you talked about how we could possibly work together, um, practical steps to um, embrace the ADA and, and its restrictions in our communities. Um, uh, to, to make the sacraments, to, to, to push back against sacramental exclusion, other practical suggestions you might make on how we can work together to confront the uh, realities of Christian ableism that you mentioned. Yeah, thanks, bud. Um, in, my, in the second half of my thesis, um, I talk about restorative justice and how I believe restorative or transformative justice tools can be used to undo some of this harm. We can do things like have, con have conversation circles, have a circle process. We can do things like have one-on-one -on -one conversations. We can do things like acknowledging and truth-telling about the harm that's happened and asking the people who have been harmed what they need and figuring out who's accountable for making the change. So I offer that restorative and transformative justice processes already exist. We don't have to come up with something new. We can use these tools that people have been using for hundreds, thousands of years in order to undo some of that harm. 
So that's my that's my offering that if you're interested in doing some of this harm and you're close to home in your own community or your own institution, to look into practice of the restorative and transformative justice and engage those. Okay. Uh, perhaps in the you could give us some sources for uh, restorative and just restorative justice where people might turn for resources in the in the chat. But let's turn to a question from Tom Murphy. Allison, thank you so much. Um, maybe less a question, but just a resonance that I really heard there as you were talking about the opposition to the ADA. Uh, it reminded me of there's a footnote uh, in in one of Hans Reinders' books. Um, I forget where it is, but basically he says in all of his research, all of his conversations with pastors about disability in their churches, the number one response he's received about is when bringing up people with disabilities is we don't have them. Um, and I think you sort of said the same thing there, but um, you know, when I think about my own like ableist tendencies, like I, I read that footnote years ago, it was so indicting, you know, I, I did not see people in my world uh, with disabilities because I'm so focused on the sort of normate and, and how I uh, e experience the world that um, I had to really um, do some work. So, so the restorative justice stuff you're talking about, I think is huge. And, and just the mindsets and the, the way that we approach one another, uh, the interior work we have to do is so important. So that all just came up here as you're, you're talking. So thanks so much for this important work, Allison. Yeah, thank you. And I'd say the statistic I think many of us know is one in four, one in five people are disabled. You have more than four or five people in your community, in your friend circle, in your family, there's someone who's disabled there. You know, this is not all about outreach. This is not all about getting more people in the church. This is about recognizing who's already there, whether or not they identify as disabled, whether or not they kind of have come to this understanding of themselves. And that's why I loved the conversation about universal design for learning knowing and assuming these people are already are already here among us. And sometimes it's us. Allison, I have a, a question to go back to one of the examples you used where, um, you know, the person with disabilities was uh, introduced by, singled out by the pastor and, and, and called an, an angel. Um, I was at once present for something very similar, and I asked the pastor about it, and and he was sincerely trying to include. That was his his effort at inclusion, you know, acknowledge this person as a member of the congregation, and and sort of, he was trying to welcome the person, but that did wasn't the way that it came across at all. What advice would you have, or what recommendations you have for pastor leaders about welcoming um, people? Um, into community in, in situations like that, where they where there where there's obviously somebody who who has special needs or who has um, um, you know who who might need some who who effort might be needed to include them. Like, what would be a, a better way to try to create an inclusive environment? Yeah, great question. Something the big question for me when I think about inspiration porn is who is this for? Who is this for? Who is benefiting from this? Who is, who is kind of getting something out of this? And the question is, is it, is it the disabled person? Have you talked to this person? They want to be held up. They want to be singled out in this way, in this service. Awesome. If that is what they want, that is great. There's consent there. There is mutuality there. There is agency there. You know, maybe that, maybe that doesn't feel like inspiration porn if it is for the disabled person. Any other reason to single out a disabled person, especially when it's to make someone else feel better, to make an abled person feel better for assuming an abled audience, that's inspiration porn. That's not consent. That's not agency. That's not inclusion. So my, the question that I always ask is, who is this benefiting? Who is this for? And who decided that this was going to happen? Great. Wonderful. There's a question in the chat I'd, I'd like to share, uh, ask you to respond to, Allison. Um, could you take... Could you talk a bit about internalized ableism um, and your response to Tom uh, made the person, made Kathy think of this question? Totally, yeah, I think um, what Kathy's referring to is this idea that maybe some people don't understand themselves or identify as disabled. Um, I, think, I think a lot of reasons to that. First, I'm not in the practice of telling people they're disabled. Hey, have you ever thought you're actually disabled, you know, congratulations. That doesn't, that doesn't go great. Um, that's not something that I tend to do. 
And of course people have internalized ableism when society tells you that being disabled is a terrible thing, that it will ruin your life, that it will totally transform what your possibilities are. Of course people don't wanna be disabled. Of course you don't wanna align yourself with this community that's been marginalized. It makes all the sense in the world. And when people can understand a you know, positive or neutral understanding of disability, can understand the solidarity among disabled communities, especially inter cross disability solidarity, um, when they can understand that there are possibilities for being disabled in the world that are liberative and kind and caring and gentle, there are other ways to be. I think we have a responsibility to show people that being disabled is not a terrible, tragic thing. Yes, it can come with pain. Yes, it can come with challenge. Yes, ableism is here. And when we can show people that there are possibilities for being disabled that aren't tragic, that will go a long way into undoing internalized ableism. I think it's not really fair to say, oh, you know, you have internalized ableism, you've got to deal with that. I think it's, oh, you have internalized these terrible messages that we've been giving you. And of course you think about yourself this way. So I think there's really a responsibility on the, on the broader picture that abled people and, and ableist disabled people um, have in allowing people to kind of freely understand themselves in a way that is most meaningful and most authentic. Thank you, well said, well said. There's a comment in the uh, chat from Elizabeth Foster, who says she's working on issues of restorative justice uh, in a related area. And I wondered if Elizabeth would want to comment more on that or ask a question uh, based on her own work. Oh, hi, sure. I I'm just, yeah, curious about your experience. I, I was just really excited to find you working with um, sort of the ADA topic because that's something I've worked in a little in an interfaith context. Um, I don't know. Certainly, um, my my work with the eugenics movement right now is in the context of um, the Unitarian and Universalist churches in, in the 1920s. So it's um, less uh, specifically applicable to to um, a Catholic context um, just because uh, the the Catholic Church was really the one church that that largely resisted um, that movement but um, yeah I'm just sort of very curious generally about sort of your work there and whether our projects could sort of speak to each other in terms of um, yeah, just sort of doing doing similar work on different uh, different but related topics. Yeah, totally. I I love that. I think it's so important. I think such an important part of restorative or transformative justice is telling the truth, saying something bad happened here. You know, maybe we haven't acknowledged it before, but we really messed up, or our ancestors really messed up. And there's something there's something that really needs to be addressed here, even if it happened a long time ago. Even if we want to distance ourselves from it, we can't do that. That's not responsible. That's not ethical. And that's not in line with what our faith values tell us to do. Um, so I, I totally think there's a lot of overlap there. And I'll, I'll say, I mentioned this before, but the other reason that I think using restorative or transformative justice tools is so important is because they already exist. I think it can be so easy to think we need to come up with new ways of responding, new tools, new practices, you know, shiny, shiny new ways of, of fixing things. Um, I think it's so important to say, actually, this has been around forever and it's worked for so many different people for a really long time. And if we can harness these tools to undo similar and yet different and unique types of harm, you know, why, why wouldn't we do that? Work smarter, not harder. So Elizabeth, I'd love to connect more. I think that's so exciting to hear that you're doing this work too. Yeah, I, I love that as well. And I think that's exactly right. Thank you so much for, for offering this in general. Our time is coming to a close, but I wonder if we could have a quick comment from Ian and then a quick comment from Tom Reynolds and we'll end after that. Okay, um, two things. Thank you so so much, Allison, for because um, I really did enjoy listening to everything that you said. And and actually, I'm I'm going to pick up on something Harold said when he talked about um, you know when we have people with special needs. And I'm going to quote Eric Carter because he says it best, I think, um, and it helps us to maybe move the conversation beyond the ableist presumptions. And it says there are no special needs, only human needs. Some will require more intentionality to support. But it's important for us to make that distinction. You know, his research on belonging has already been talked to, referenced multiple times. But but that's when I share, actually, his ten dimensions of belonging. When I in in pastoral workshops, folks will say, "Well, gosh, that's what I want too." Um, 
And and the only thing and the other thing I should have thought of this yesterday. Um, I put in the chat a link to it's just, we have more Catholics. I we have not, I wasn't thinking of it, um, but anyway, two things. I put in a link for my office website, the ministry website that has resources. But then also I did a link for a survey that's specifically for the synod. So if you want to share with the Catholic Church your experiences of disability life and the Catholic Church. Um, that could be incorporated into the Synod report. There, I've got an online survey, and so um, feel free to contribute and share it with others. This is also for folks with disabilities as well as those who care about individuals with disabilities. Thank you, Anne. Very helpful. Tom, we'll give you uh, a comment, and then we'll give the final word to Allison. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'll be really brief. Allison, thank you so much, and thank you to Thomas and Thomas. I'm jumping out of my seat here with excitement in the restorative justice frame. Um, and, and I think the question, and I just wonder what you think is not so, not only who's there, but who's where, where's the leadership um, countering ableism in communities without leadership by people with disabilities, that that's a problem. And it's exciting to see more and more leadership engaged. And I wondered if you encountered that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think, you know, I think what I'd say about that is the barriers to leadership for disabled people, especially in, you know, I think about ministry, all the hoops that you have to jump through to get ordained, all the hoops that you have to jump through to be a leader in a Christian context. You know, the ways that disabled people are seen as not having the capacity to be leaders because, because they are disabled. And I'd say one of the, my favorite disability buzz, buzzwords is interdependence. You know, we need each other. We depend on each other. We don't do this alone. And I think when we better understand interdependence, we'll understand that disabled people can be leaders and they can depend on each other and on other people in a way that we don't usually let ministers do. We usually kind of hold up ministers, ministerial leaders as having to be the only one, the buck stops here, I'm it. And I think if we can understand, you know, really kind of transform our understanding of ministry and so we can be interdependent, we can need each other. That is still a valid way to lead. That's an important way to lead. In fact, it teaches us things that I think will get more disabled people in leadership and more disabled people in ministry. So I do think it's a, it's a paradigm shift. I appreciate the question. Just the last thing I'll say, I'd be really remiss if I didn't thank Dr. Shana McAllister specifically for being such a fabulous instructor for me when I was in seminary and really, um, really inspired my work. So I just wanted to say thanks for all you did to put this together. Well, I think that um, Allison's words were a great place to end. Just thanks again to Tom and Thomas and Allison for stimulating presentations and to all of you for some wonderful conversation, uh, wonderful resources and, and wonderful resources to turn to and wonderful ideas to think about. So thank you again. And the symposium will continue uh, this afternoon. So thank you and uh, we'll, we'll close here. Well, welcome back uh, everyone and uh, welcome to any new folks who are joining us.